All right, what we're going to look at now is lab 17. There's two parts to lab 17. The first part is using a 74-121, a one-shot multivibrator. Uh, and then the second half, we're going to use the 555 timer uh, to do an A-stable multivibrator. So the chip that we'll be using is the 74-121. The data sheet is now up on Brightspace, and you can do that. And it's a one-shot. So basically what's going to happen is when you trigger it, it will create a pulse. And the width of that pulse is determined by the RC network, which you're gonna hook up to the chip. So um, you're gonna see a big diagram in this lab. Everything inside the outline of that box is inside the chip, so you don't have to worry about it. So in terms of the circuit itself on the protoboard, it's gonna be very straightforward. You're gonna have a resistor. That goes up to VCC, and you're going to have a capacitor that goes between pin 10 and 11. Now, the formula for that is the pulse width is going to equal 0.7 times R times C, and you're given everything in this formula except for the resistor, which you'll have to calculate. So, they want you to have a resistor of, uh, sorry, a pulse width of 50 microseconds. So that's going to be 0.7 times R times C, and you're given the C, it's 0.01 microfarads. Uh, in your kit, that will be a 103. If you use a 104, you'll be off by a factor of 10 in your pulse width. So now all we have to do is basically solve for R. So your R is going to equal to 50 microseconds uh, over point. 7 times 0 0.01 microfarads. And make sure you do all the units properly. If you do that properly, the resistor will work out to be, I think, around 7.1K, give or take. You'll, if you use a calculator, you'll get the, wrong, uh, the right number, but that's just roughly where it's going to be. So that means that this capacitor here is going to be 0 0.01 microfarads. And this resistor is going to be um, going to be around 7.1k. So if you do that, that will give you a pulse width of 50 microseconds. Now we're going to trigger that with a function generator, uh, and you're going to see three outputs that we're going to use, which are these here. So. The difference between the A1, the A2, and the B, or the difference between the A input and the B input is whether you want to trigger it from a positive going transition or from a negative going transition. Now, the truth table, the section of the truth table that we want is this lower section. So that's where it's generating the pulses. So if you see an arrow going down in the truth table, an arrow going down is negative going transition. So if you see an arrow going down, that's negative going transition. If you see an arrow going up, that's going to be positive going transition. Now, positive going transition just means a signal that's going from low to high. And the negative going transition will be a signal going from uh, high to low. So, the lab will tell you which you want. So, the, in step three of the procedure, it says assume that you want to trigger from a leading edge. So that's a positive going transition. So then, you're, then you have to use either one of these. So because we're using a positive going transition, you want to look for the lines in the truth table for the up arrows. Now you can use either one is fine. So that means that since the up arrow is on pin B, that means your function generator is gonna go here. So your function generator is gonna go to pin five is that's the B input. Now, pins th you can either put pin A1 low or A2 low, it doesn't matter. Because if, if A1 is low, then A2 is don't care, which means that can be low or high, it's not really gonna matter. So, I'm just gonna arbitrarily just put pin three low. That's really all you need to do. So that's everything you need to know to get this circuit to work. So the function generator is gonna go to B, because we're using a positive going transition or leading edge trigger. Um, and then pin three, uh, pin three or pin four, either one, as long as one of them is low, you're fine.
So what's going to happen when you do this? So you're basically going to have a pulse. So you're going to have your clock. And you're going to have your Q output. So you're going to need two scope probes for this. So you want the first one to be here. Channel one is going to be on the clock. Channel two is going to be on the output. So that's going to be pin six. So what are you going to see? So you're going to have a clock. Whenever I have a clock and I know I'm using positive going transitions, I always put a little up arrow on the positive going transitions. It just makes it easier for me to identify where, I'm, where it's going to be hit. So basically what's going to happen is you're using this clock signal or the function generator, the one that's going into pin B as your trigger source. So whenever this chip, the 74121, whenever it sees a positive going transition, it's going to create a pulse that's 50 microseconds wide. And then it's going to go back down again. Okay. So this is one shot. This is a monostable, which means it has one stable state. Uh, when we looked at the NAND latch, it could be stable in either state. So the NAND latch is really, if you want to use a long word for it, is a bi-stable multivibrator because it's got two stable states. The one shot is a monostable. So that's a mono. Monostable multivibrator, which means it has one stable state, which is down or zero. You can make it go up, but it'll stay up for a while and then it will come back down. So that's its only stable state. So based on the R and C that you have here, that will determine the width of this pulse. And every time there's a trigger, it'll generate a 50 microsecond pulse. And it'll wait until it gets another trigger. So right here, another positive going transition, and it will create another 50 microsecond pulse. Now, these monostable multivibrators come in two flavors, if you will. One is re-triggerable and one is non-re-triggerable. So part of what they want you to do in this lab is to determine experimentally whether the 74121 is re-triggerable or not re-triggerable. So first we have to know what a retrigger means or what retriggering means, and then we have to be able to spot the difference. So in this particular instance, this frequency is pretty slow compared to this. So we retrigger it here, and then this pulse is done, and then we have another leading edge, which causes another trigger event, which causes another pulse to be generated. If you're running at this frequency, it's going to be impossible to tell experimentally whether it's re-triggerable or not re-triggerable because we're not re-triggering it. So what does that mean? So if you increase the clock frequency, which they will have you do in the lab, by the way, Right? If you increase the clock frequency, that shouldn't change the pulse because the pulse is a factor of this RC network. But what's going to happen is every time there's a positive going transition of the clock, I generate a 50 microsecond pulse. But what happens here? This is the question that is central to the lab. What happens here? Right? This is a re-trigger. So a re-trigger in this context means I'm attempting to trigger the device again before it's finished its original pulse, okay? So this initial leading edge or positive going transition triggers the chip. If the chip is not done putting out its 50 microsecond pulse and I attempt to trigger it again while it's still working, now I'm re-triggering it. So a re-triggerable device and a non-re-triggerable device will now act differently. 
in the slower scenario I had earlier, both re-triggerable and non-re-triggerable would behave exactly the same way because I'm not re-triggering it. But here I am. So what they want you to do in the lab is you're gonna to have to increase the frequency beyond this. So what does that mean? So if the period of the clock frequency is less than the pulse width, then you're going to be re-triggering it, right? And I think for 50 microseconds, I think that's 20 kilohertz. So that means if you're slower than 20 kilohertz, you're not going to be re-triggering this chip, and you're not going to be able to tell experimentally what it is. Now, I think in the lab they ask you to go up to 50K, if I'm not mistaken. I could probably check this. Yeah, they want you to go to 50 kilohertz, good memory. Uh, but really, as long as you're over 20, so basically if you want to know what the frequency is, it's just going to be 1 over this, because if the period is the same as the pulse, slower than that is not going to re-trigger, faster than that is going to re-trigger. So if you want to know what that frequency is, just put 1 divided by your pulse width, and that will tell you the frequency at which it will start to re-trigger. So they're using 50K in the lab. If you're 25 or 30, you're probably, probably going to be safe unless your pulse is not 50 microseconds. So if it's not 50, you'll just have to put 1 over 50, and that will tell you the, the, uh, the frequency that you need to check. So now, now that we know what a re-trigger is, which is re-triggering it before this pulse is done, we need to figure out how, how it's going to do it. So if it's not re-triggerable, the re-triggers will be ignored, right? Not re-triggerable, which means you can't re-trigger it. So in this case, this trigger will be ignored. The pulse will come down. And then the next one, the next time there's a pulse and this is not busy, then this will create another one, another 50 microsecond pulse. And then there's gonna be another re-trigger here Right, because this is a clock frequency, so everything happens over and over and over again. So the first one's gonna trigger the pulse. The second one will be ignored because the chip is not re-triggerable. You can almost think of not re-triggerable as non-multitasking, right? So you ask the chip to do a job here, and then this trigger comes knocking on the door, and the chip says, don't bother me, I'm busy. When I'm done with my pulse, then I'll listen to any requests that you have. So that's what happens. This is ignored. But as soon as the pulse is done, the very next trigger that comes up will create another pulse, and then this is a re-trigger, which will again be ignored. So when you're looking at it on the scope, and we'll show you a quick demo of that in a second, um, if there's re-triggers and it's non-re-triggerable, those will be ignored, and you'll still see your individual 50 microsecond pulses. As you increase the frequency, these pulses will just get closer together. Like the, the space will get closer and closer and closer. And then if you do, if you increase this so that there's two re-triggers, they will both be ignored. And again, we'll show you a little demo of that as well. So that's what happens if it's non-re-triggerable. So that's how you can tell experimentally that the chip is not re-triggerable. You have to re-trigger it and then you see how it behaves. So if it behaves this way, where it ignores the triggers and just gives you another 50 microsecond pulse, then you can be safe in determining that that is not re-triggerable. So now we need to figure out what happens if it is re-triggerable. So if it is re-triggerable, this will behave differently. If it is re-triggerable, every single time that there's a positive going transition, it will start from that moment and draw 50 microseconds. So if this, so let's say this was my original 50 microsecond pulse, right? Right, so when this re-trigger happens, now it goes, oh, I have to draw another 50 microsecond pulse. So it starts from here and draws another 50 microsecond pulse, right? So from here, Right? But the same thing happens here. So every single trigger that comes along, this thing goes, oh, I need to create a 50 microsecond pulse. So it will start from here and draw another 50 microsecond pulse. 
But as you can probably guess, if this keeps happening, all that's going to happen and all that you're going to see on the output is just a logic high, right? Because it's going to, it always starts the new one before the next one ends, so there's always a, there's always a pulse or a high level being done. So if it's re-triggerable, you'll just see a logic high. If it's not re-triggerable, these re-triggers will be ignored. It will give you the 50 microsecond and then continue on like that. Okay, so that's the difference between re-triggerable and not re-triggerable. So the one you have in your lab is non-re-triggerable. So we're asking you kind of experimentally to determine whether this is re-triggerable or not re-triggerable. The easiest way to find out, of course, is just to look at the data sheet, and the data sheet will tell you if it's re-triggerable or not re-triggerable. But if you want to determine that experimentally, this is how you want to do it. So now we're just going to go to the oscilloscope, and I'm just going to show you a quick demo of what that actually looks like. Okay, so this is an example of what we talked about. The top wave on the oscilloscope is the clock is the clock signal, and then this is the pulse. So you can see that the pulse is 50 microseconds because we're on 20 microseconds per division. This is roughly two and a half divisions, so two and a half times 20 is 50 microseconds, so that's our pulse. And as I change the frequency, you should see that the pulse itself doesn't change, but they will move closer or further together. So I'm not re-triggering it right now because this is my leading edge which is causing the pulse to output 50 microseconds, then it comes back down, and then it waits until the next positive going transition right here to do a pulse. So if I want to re-trigger it, I'm going to increase the frequency and you can see that this trigger is coming closer and closer to the pulse now, and now it just fired, which means I am re-triggering it. I'm at roughly 24 kilohertz right now, so you can see the initial leading edge transition is creating a pulse. Here's a re-trigger right here because it's a positive going transition, but you can see it's being ignored and I'm just continuing to display my 50 microsecond pulse. And if I continue to increase the frequency, the same thing will happen again. So I have one, two, three triggers within that pulse, they're all being ignored, and you notice that as I mentioned on the board, these, these just get closer together as the frequency goes higher. So you can tell here, I'm still, I still have two triggers, so this is my initial trigger, this is my re-trigger, but you can see that this is being ignored and I'm seeing my 50 microsecond pulses continue to display. So again, this is visual proof that this particular chip, the 74121, is a non-retriggerable, monostable multivibrator.